Proverbs chapter 4, 20 through 27. My son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let, let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart and everything you do flows from it. Keep your mouth free of pervis, pervis, perversity. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the past for your feet. And be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or the left. Keep your foot from evil. Thank you, Brinkley. That's where we're focusing in tonight. Proverbs chapter 4. We've started this series and we started it la uh, not last week because we were not here last week. We started it two weeks ago and it's a series uh, on, on relationships and, and dating relationships. And uh, this month we have been answering one giant question. And the question is this, how do we find and maintain healthy relationships? How do we find and maintain healthy relationships? And so I know we were off last week because of the Super Bowl. Um, so I want to kind of give it just a real short recap on what we talked about last week uh, or two weeks ago. And so uh, we, we said that one of the most important things that we can do is begin to think about and ponder and really become crystal clear on what our dream is for our future marriage. Get past all of the physical attributes and really dig into what is it that you want. We've got to be able to define our dream. That's where everything starts. Everything starts when we can crystal clear lay out and say, this is what I want and someone that I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. This is who I want them to be. This is how I want them to, to treat me. This is how I want them to treat others. This is the kind of mom or dad I want them to be. This is the kind of work ethic I want them to have. This is the kind of grace I want them to show. This is the kind of relationship I want them to have with God. All of those things, when we can become crystal clear on those things, then we can begin to chase those relationships. And we can begin to invite people into our lives that are those things and step away from people in our lives that are not those things. And so it's really, really important that we start there. And so last week I gave you guys a list and it's out on the free table right now. It simply says, what is your dream for your future marriage? And it's got a list of questions to kind of get your mind jump started. I hope you've taken some time and you've written down some things on that list and you've spent some time thinking about it because honestly, as middle school and high school students, we don't think far enough into the future. And, and, and we spend not enough time thinking about our dream for our future marriage. And so uh, that's, that's what we talked about last week. That's where we're, where we're headed from here. This week is all about improving yourself as you prepare for future relationships. But first, I wanna, I wanna tell you this. I was 17 years old. And when I was 17 years old, my parents took me on a spring break vacation uh, and we got to go on a cruise. I was super excited that we got to go on this cruise. Um, <clears throat> and part of this cruise was snorkeling. Now I'm a person that from the time I was little, 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 I loved the water. I loved being in the water. I loved holding my breath as long as I possibly could. I loved diving as deep as I possibly could. Everything about being in the water, I just absolutely loved. So when I got a chance to go snorkeling, I was pumped. I was super excited because I knew two things. I was gonna get to see some awesome fish and that I was a strong enough swimmer that I was probably gonna be able to take a deep breath through my snorkel and dive down and get close to the fish. And so I bought a cheap little underwater disposable camera and I was ready to go and they slapped fins on my feet, which was even more awesome because I could go even deeper, which was absolutely incredible. I will never forget. I got to go out and snorkel and we saw like clownfish in and out of coral and I would dive under and snap pictures and try to touch fish, which I never even got close, but, um, but it, it was absolutely incredible. And then the guide gathered us all together and he said, all right, follow me. I want to show you something. And so we all kind of follow him and we're on the surface of the water and he dives down uh, at the base of these rocks. 
And he reaches into this pouch and he pulls out a piece of fish. And he just kind of starts to slowly wave it over the water. And so we're watching from the surface of the water and this giant green moray eel comes out of the rocks to chase this fish. It looked just like that. And, and so I'm watching and I'm like, dude, this is awesome, right? And I'm having visions of like the little mermaid, the moray eels. And so the, a few things you have to know about moray eels. They are some of, they are the third largest eel in the world. Uh, green moray eels are on average are about six feet long, but they can grow to nine feet long and weigh as much as 65 pounds one eel, which is absolutely crazy. Their, their jaw is specially designed to grab uh, fish that they will eat and not let those fish go. And so on the top row, on the top of their jaw, they have two rows of teeth and super sharp teeth and their teeth are facing backwards so that as a fish swims by, they can grab it and then the fish can't escape. Their bottom row has one, bottom jaw has one row of teeth also facing backwards. And so uh, there have been, uh, they're relatively docile creatures unless they are disturbed. And if they're disturbed, then they will attack humans. Um, and and the mucus on their skin can cause all kinds of problems because they're, when they bite you, their teeth are super, super sharp. So they just tear you to shreds. And then that mucus gets in there and uh, it can cause horrible infections and severe blood loss and can actually be life-threatening. Keep all this in mind. So I'm a 17 year old kid. I'm on the surface of the water and I'm like, this is awesome. I'm gonna get as close as I can as possible. I'm gonna get an awesome picture. So I take this huge breath and I dive under the water and I'm kicking my feet with my fins as much as I possibly can. And I actually got pretty close to this moray eel. And I was getting down there and I was taking pictures and uh, I actually looked for the pictures that I took. I couldn't find them. They're lost somewhere, but, but I'm, I'm taking these pictures and I'm like, dude, this is incredible. And then I froze. I froze as this moray eel did that. And it ignored the fish that this guy was trying to feed and immediately started coming straight for me. And I was like, okay. And everything kind of went in slow motion. Uh, and I don't think I even realized how much danger I was really in. Like, I didn't really know about moray eels. I just thought this is really cool. But my guide immediately knew how much danger I was in. And I will never forget looking over and seeing my guide's eyes about pop out of his head. And he has this fish and he immediately swims over and he's like shaking this fish like crazy in front of this moray eel. And this moray eel is still just swimming next to me. And so I kind of am like frozen there in the water and just kind of floating backward, waiting for to see what happens. And uh, he's like shaking this fish and the moray eel just kind of turns and then goes over and eats the fish. And, uh, and I sat there in the water and uh, the guy just looks at me and he goes, And I was like, okay. And I went back to the surface and my family was like, dude, you're an idiot. What were you thinking? And I was like, yeah, yeah, uh, I'm an idiot. Um, and so, so the, bo the book of Proverbs, you heard Brinkley read this, this earlier. The book of Proverbs chapter four um, is a pretty incredible section of scripture. It says this, my son, be attentive to my words and incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart for they are life to those that find them and healing to all their flesh. Now, let me stop there because the, the proverb writer starts this off and he's been talking about wisdom. He's been talking about gaining wisdom and being wise and how having wisdom will improve your life. And then he goes into this, this chapter four and he says, listen, I'm about to tell you something that is really, really important. You want to know about wisdom? You want to have wisdom? Listen to what I'm about to say. Take it into your heart, absorb it, and live by this. What he is about to say is of vital importance. And then he says this, keep your heart with all vigilance for from it flow the springs 
of life. Keep your heart with all vigilance. Because here's the deal. Everything that we do and everything that we are comes from here. Everything that we do and everything that we are comes from our hearts. Our hearts, our hearts are what give us our life. Our hearts, and not just the physical blood that's pumping through our body. Our hearts are what give us, give us our, our personalities and our lives. And, and when our hearts are full and joyful and healthy, my, our life is good. And when our hearts are broken and scarred and damaged, it can be devastating to our life. And he says, everything you do, as you step forward into life, as you step forward into the rest of your middle school, the rest of your high school career, as you step out of high school and into college, as, as we as adults in this room, as we step into our, our careers or into our relationships, everything we do flows from here. And so he's clear. He says, listen, you have to keep your heart with all vigilance. Other translations say, above all else, guard your heart. Above all else, you protect this. Because everything you do flows from here. This has to be protected. More than anything else, this has to be protected. And so the question is, how do we guard our hearts? Like in a, in a practical day-to-day going through the motions, how do we guard our hearts? And I, I think there's, there's one way that we think about guarding our hearts that is not super healthy, and there's another way that we think about guarding our hearts that he talks about here in Proverbs 4 that I think is a more healthy way to guard our hearts. The, First, let's talk about the not healthy way to guard our hearts. And I think this is the way that we tend uh, to have, have preached in the past. And this is the way that we have tend to encourage middle school and high school students to go toward. And I have been guilty of this. And for that, I have to apologize. Because I don't think this is the healthiest way to guard our hearts. I think sometimes we think, all right, I've got to guard my heart. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my heart and I am going to lock it away. And I'm not going to date. I'm not going to be interested in anybody from the opposite sex. I'm not going to dream about my future marriage and what that's going to look like. Because if I start to dream about my future marriage and I start to think I want a person that's like that or like that, I don't want to be like that like my parents are, but I do want to be like that like my parents are. If I start to think about those things, then I'm going to start to become interested in people around me. And if I become interested in people around me, I might start dating. I might get my heart broken. So I'm just going to take my heart and I'm going to lock it away and I'm going to put it up and I'm not going to be even interested in dating because I'm in middle school or high school. Now, let me be very clear before I move forward. I am not saying that you should go out and date just to be dating. I'm not saying that if you aren't dating anyone, there is anything wrong with you. Let me share with you guys a little bit of my story. Um, when I was in middle school, I was girl crazy. And after I got past the kind of girl crazy stage, I decided I'm not going to date. Like, that's just not on my horizon. I'm just going to put that away. In high school, I, I think I went on three one-time dates, maybe, in my high school career. And so, uh, college, I didn't really date. I think I maybe went on two dates. Um, I didn't really date anyone until I met Kirsten my senior year of college. Now, there's good and there's bad to that. You guys, for, for a while, I took my heart and I just kind of locked it away and I, I didn't think. Um, and and, uh, and I, I, I just kind of placed it on the shelf. And, and I realized as I was going through high school and college that there had to be a change 
there had to be something where I at least moved toward a dream. And so I, I began to kind of think, all right, what is it that I actually want? And so I started kind of, like I asked you guys to do, make a list. And I, I wanted someone that was going to be an awesome mom. I wanted someone that loved God and was going to make me a better person in my own relationship with Jesus Christ. I wanted someone that like crazily loved other people around them and that would just exuded love toward other people. And, and having that list is part of the reason that in college I didn't date as much. You see, in high school, I kind of just put things away and, and just didn't think a whole lot about it. In college, I thought more about it. But, but I started like comparing people to what I wanted. And I was like, well, they're, they're not, they're not, they're, like they don't meet the, necessarily the criteria that I want. When I met Kirsten though, she was all of that. And so I was confident in being able to step into that relationship that it was going to be a, a healthier relationship than I could have stepped into if I had just looked around campus and said, oh, she's pretty. And, and this is what happens. This is what happens is we tend to look around and say, she's pretty. And like, that's our only criteria. We've got to improve ourselves. We've got to step beyond that. And, and this is what I love about what the proverb writer says in Proverbs chapter four. He talks about how we, how we speak and uh, to put away crooked speech and, and devious talk. And that is a part of our relationships, how we interact with other people, how we speak. And then he says this, and, and this is really what applies to, I think, our dating lives as we move forward. He says, let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. This proverb writer is not saying, take your heart out, put it away, don't even be interested in the opposite sex, don't date, don't dream, don't, don't move forward. The proverb writer is saying, listen, Find your dream, be crystal clear about it. What do you want your future husband, your future wife to be like? Get past all the physical attributes. Let's, let's get down to the nitty gritty. What, what kind of relationship with God do you want him to have? What kind, what kind of work ethic do you want him to have? What, how do you want them to treat other people? Like on a normal daily basis, people they like, people that irk them and rub them the wrong way? How do you want them to talk about other people? How do you want them to, to treat you? And let's, let's be crystal clear about that. And then he says, keep your eyes directly forward. He's saying, you move toward that goal. Ponder the path of your feet. Ponder the path of your feet and, and do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. He's saying, listen, you find a goal, you find a dream for your life, for your marriage, for your relationships, and you go straight for that dream. And guys, here's the cool thing about guarding our hearts. And when we are able uh, to, to really do this, is that if we can find a goal and go toward that dream for our lives and our future relationships... We will guard our hearts. When we can begin to clarify that dream and go after that dream, suddenly someone will come into our lives who is interested in us or we are interested in them. And we will say, all right, let me pause and think about my future life with this person. What does that look like? Is that taking me toward that dream? And oftentimes what we'll find is no. And we can step to the side. And those are some hard decisions, but those are some heart guarding decisions. Those are some self improvement decisions. You want to improve yourself in your relationships, in your future marriage, you find a dream for what your future marriage looks like and you go straight for that dream. You focus straight forward and you don't turn to the right or to the left. You want to improve yourself in anything in your life. You find a future dream in whatever 
that is. And that will help you make decisions on what things you should include in your life and what things you should get rid of in your life. That's where self-improvement happens. And what's really, really, really cool about this is that when I started saying, I want someone that is going to be stronger in Christ and going to make me a better person in Christ, I realized I probably need to be a better person in Christ. And there were times where uh, you know, when I met Kirsten, where she said, CJ, have you really thought about this? And I had to think, I want someone that's going to make me a better person in Christ. I should probably take what she's saying pretty seriously. It's incredible the way that we guard our hearts when we find a dream and we move toward that dream. When I was snorkeling, I did not pause for any moment of time to think what I really wanted out of this snorkeling adventure. If I had, if I had paused to think, what do I really want out of this snorkeling adventure? I would have said, I want to see some cool fish. I want to go underwater and get close to some cool fish. And at the end of the day, I want to come back safe. I would rather not come back with my arm mauled to death and profusely bleeding. And if I had taken some time and I had thought about that, I still would have dove down and tried to get close to some clownfish, because they're clownfish. I probably would not have dove down and tried to get close to a moray eel that could rip my arm off, because that's just not smart. And that's not taking me toward my dream. That could have completely ruined the rest of our vacation. But see, so often what we do is we take our hearts and we don't go toward a dream. We take our hearts and we don't pause and think, all right, what do I really want for my future? We take our hearts and we dive down toward the moray eel and we put our hearts in danger. And then our hearts get chomped and scarred and damaged and we have to move forward with a broken heart. So I want, what I want to challenge you guys with is how do we move forward and guard our hearts in our relationships? It's not about taking your heart and putting it away and not even thinking about your future. I don't think that's healthy. It is about defining your dream for your future marriage and then chasing that dream with everything you've got and lining up all future relationships to that dream that you have and inviting people into your life that help you accomplish that dream and stepping away from people in your life that are pulling you away from that dream. It's about improving yourself as you chase your future husband or wife. And, and I, I love what the proverb writer says. He says, you've got to keep moving forward. You've got to keep moving toward your dream. And so the, to go back to the question that we have been answering this month and will continue to answer this month, how do I Find and maintain healthy relationships. The first thing is this. Define your dream for what your future marriage looks like. Define that. Get down to the nitty gritty. Pause for just a moment and, and think about your future 10, 15, 20 years from now and think, what do I want my life to look like? And then move toward that dream. Maybe that is dating that person that you look at and you say, man, they are taking me toward that dream. Maybe that is stepping away and saying, you know what? There's probably someone better in my future. But everything we do, we hold up to that dream that we have. And we say, all right, is this going toward my dream or not? Now, now I want to say something that is vitally important. And um, I, I want you guys to hear this. 
Seriously, hear this. Some of you are sitting here and you've given your hearts to the moray eels. And they're hurt and they're damaged and they're broken. And part of what guarding our hearts is, is saying, I made some mistakes. And then recognizing God is a God that fixes things. God is a God of grace and love. God is a God that takes our brokenness and picks it up and puts it back together. And recognizing that just because our past is what our past is, our future doesn't have to look like that. And you guys, if you are sitting here with a broken heart today, first of all, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you're hurt. I'm sorry that your heart is broken. And second of all, I want to tell you you're loved. You are loved more than you could ever imagine. And third of all, you have a dream for your future. And just because there is a small piece of your past where your heart is broken, it does not mean that your dream for your future is shattered. God is a God that says, let's start now. Let's start over. Let me help you pick up the pieces and mend things and put things back together. And here's what I'm confident of, because I've lived this, that when you can take your crystal clear dream and chase it in spite of your past, when you find that dream, that person is going to say, I love you in spite of your past. And so what I encourage you to do is what this proverb writer says. You define your dream and you sprint toward it. And along the way, you just continue to improve yourself. This, this thing about defining our dream, it doesn't end when you get married. It'll be something that you think about for the rest of your life. What do I want my life to look like 10, 15, 20 years from now? As I think about my future marriage with Kirsten, what do I want my future marriage to look like 10, 15, 20 years from now? It's so important that we keep that in front of us and we chase that and we allow that to clarify where we're headed and improve the things that we let into our life and the things that we discard from our life. And so I wanna give you guys a, a, a really practical challenge. I give you guys a practical challenge every single week. Uh, and I, I want to give you guys another one this week, and it's simply this. If you have not picked up one of those pieces of paper and started to fill it out where you can define your dream, they're out on the free table. Just go pick one of those pieces of paper up and, and begin to think, what is my dream for my future marriage? And the second thing is this. Maybe you've already done that. I want you to take an honest look at your decisions that you're making. I want you to take an honest look at the relationships that are currently a part of your life and ask yourself, is that taking me toward my dream? Is that taking me toward the future that I want? And, and just be brutally honest and, and allow people to speak into your life. Maybe you need to talk to a trusted adult about a relationship you're in. Maybe you need to talk to a trusted adult about an addiction that you have. Maybe you need to talk to a trusted adult about uh, just some things you need to improve or work on. Or maybe you just need to talk to a trusted adult and say, hey, what, what's, some, what's some good visions? What's some good dreams for my future marriage? We have adults in the room that would love to speak to you about that. And so I want to encourage you, begin making a list. And if you have a conversation, uh, come have a conversation with one of us adults in the room. We would love to talk to you. So let me pray for you guys. God, thank you so much.